What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Big Dave, here. I came across a video on the internet here, and it is called Pagans and Heathens Don't Get Fooled from a, an outfit uh, who calls themselves Tribe of the Fox. And um, before I start doing this, this is a critique video, it is. Uh, I want to say that the guy in this video, I have nothing personal against this guy. This is not some sort of internet flame war. This is in, done completely in frith. I have no way attacking this guy or saying anything about his family. I am not implying that he's some sort of nefarious actor or anything like that. And I will go on the record and say he seems like a nice guy. He seems like a nice guy. He's the kind of guy that I would hang out with. I would drink a beer with this dude and have a debate with him because that's what this is. This is a friendly debate. And I want to um, you know, talk about some of his uh, ideas that he espouses here that I believe are f fundamentally incorrect. And um, we're going we're gonna to dig right into that. But first and foremost, I'd like to apologize to everybody. I haven't been making the same amount of content that I have been, um, you know, that I usually do. I got a baby on the way. Uh, my grandfather passed away. And old, old Dave's been uh, focusing on his, on his clan and his family and uh, getting himself in order. Man, I've been hitting the, the Temple of Pump. Check me out. Uh, mm, temple of Pump. So I've been trying to get my health in order and... And uh, get rid of some of this dad, dad sympathy weight and stuff. Like that. <laughs> some of the some of the COVID pounds, trying to lose that and get get in better shape and do that kind of stuff. So anyway, let's get right let's get right into this. Uh, this video is called "Pagans and Heathens Don't Get Fooled," and it's by Tribe of the Fox. And I'm gonna fast forward through a lot of it because I don't want this video to end up being like an hour or something long. I want to hit all of his points. As fast as I can, not to uh, drag on and be a motor mouth like I am. So let's get started here. Uh, let's listen to it. Good morning. My name is Martin, and this is the tribe of the fox. And today I want to uh, speak about how not to get fooled, how to keep a free mind. Very important. So, okay. The beauty. Uh, of paganism, hedonism, animism, is that it's not dogmatic. There are no people who guard uh, the teachings. So that's a beautiful thing. It's about experiencing yourself. Okay, number one, he uh, presupposed. First of all, number one, him saying that there is no dogma is a is is, is a dogma. Yeah, it's a dogmatic idea. When you assemble thoughts, when you organize thoughts and you, you put them into a coherent fashion, that becomes a dogma. Whether or not that's a dirty buzzword or not to you, it doesn't matter. The definition remains the same. Now, as far as gatekeepers of the knowledge and stuff like that, we had an order of priests. Historically, you can go look. There has always been an order of priests. They used to pass it down, pass stuff down orally. But throughout all of Indo-European traditions, uh, Germanic tradition is no different. We had an order of priests, and in fact, we had a caste of people that were uh, brought up to be specifically the gatekeepers of the knowledge and of the faith. So yes, in short order, it absolutely is dogmatic. Uh about free speech about it, about free thinking about what you are doing. So that's, that's very nice. So, okay. What do I have here? Let's, let's start. <laughs> this is a very old copy, you know, it's even with tape on it. <laughs> it's a very old copy of the Edda poetry. And, um, this describes the, the, the deities and the other beings, the giants, the dwarfs, and so on, um, in Germanic mythology. So it's extremely fun to read. I do this since my teens. I read it, and it's, uh, it's just very interesting. However, should you take this as dogma? Now, this is almost like saying, yeah, duh, of course not. Well some people do i mean that's your own business if you do that you know i'm not criticizing you for this of course not who am i to do that but i don't take this literally because the edda right well number one um literally is is that's that's kind of like a grug 
understanding of how you you look at hierology. Hierology meaning your your uh, core of sources that you use to draw forth your ideas. If you do not have a hierology, you have no source. You have no uh, epistemological warrant for which you can uh, conceive and create your ideas or to fall back on for your ideas. So when you say there is no higher hierology, there is nothing to base our ideology on, where where do your ideas come from then? Hmm? It just, you know, this has been a problem for a long time. People say that, and then it just makes a gray area for people to make stuff up. And that's what we're going to get into today here, unfortunately. Writings are written down in an era that Iceland was already Christian, and uh, it is actually written down by a Christian, Snorri Sturluson. This is another mistake that a lot of these guys make. Um... They conflate the poetic edda with the prose edda. They are they are different. This is one of the. I used to think this too. A lot of people, everything this guy says, uh, everybody when they come in, they learn this. And unfortunately, what happens is uh, when people say the wrong thing for so long, it eventually becomes canon. Essentially, you know, the group think becomes, and you could see the way that this guy's kind of like smiling and and like being. And I don't think this guy's a bad guy. I think he's just trying to put out. Uh, what he believes is truth, what he what he understands to be is truth. And he's you know, it takes a lot of stones to put your face out there and put yourself out there. So I'm not I'm not ripping this guy here. So what uh, the problem is, is that um, these these things have been uh, repeated for so long. Everybody just assumes that they're true and nobody really knows where they come from because they've been told there's no epistemological basis for anything. So they just. Say, oh well, everybody says this, so it just it, it, it's group think, so therefore it must be true, but it's not true, unfortunately. There is a difference between the prose and the poetic edda. The prose edda was written by Snorri, St- Snorri Sturluson. The poetic edda was not. The poetic edda, we do know, we can confirm by the archaic language in the document. Several, even the academics agree. Even uh, what's his name, uh, Jackson Crawford agrees th- that the poetic edda is indeed a pre-Christian, authentic, heathen document. That is proven. That's not up for debate. That is legitimately what it is. It's legitimately an authentic pre-Christian heathen text. It is a heathen text. It is not a Christian text. And when you talk about Snorri Sturluson, yes, he, there's some Christian contamination in the prose edda. However, when you juxtapose it and you cross-compare it with the poetic edda as well as other Indo-European sources, you can draw from... Uh, the prose edda, much of it is authentic, and we can prove that, and we have a methodology that we use to prove what is authentic in it and what, it, what should be discarded. So let's move on here. Pretty interesting. Now, the Christian elements in this is, for instance, um, that Odin is really portrayed like almost, almost like the Christian-like god, you know, the, as a supreme, all-knowing god. No, he is not d- displayed as being uh, omnipresent. He's not. There, it's actually very clearly uh, defined in there. In fact, Snorri Sturluson, you know, purposely euhemerizes the gods and limits their powers in his book. So I'm not sure uh, where you got this interpretation that that Odin. Now, is is Odin very very powerful? Of course he is. He's the All Father. He's the Sky Father. He's he's the the you know, as the Hindus would say, the King of Heaven. He's the King of the Gods. Why wouldn't he be powerful? And he, he probably is the closest to omnipresent that we have, but he is not omnipresent. He does not know your, your instincts. He does not know your intentions. He does not know your inner thoughts all the time. You know, that's, that is why you have a filgya. That is why you have dis. That is why you go before the hell thing and you have these, these uh, repre- representatives at, your, um, at the hell thing. That's why you have those, because the All Father cannot know everything that you do or think or all of your intentions. You need to have somebody that is a, an entity that is with you to represent you in the afterlife. So no, that's I don't know how he got that interpretation. And um, of course, then you need an enemy, a devil. Well, that became the God Loki. Loki is a jerk. Uh, He's the betrayer of the gods. He get, he ends up in Niffle Hell with his mouth sewn shut. He, you know, I mean, why why wouldn't there be a bad guy? You know, I mean, like they have enemies. 
You know, I mean, they have enemies. You look at the Hindu corpus, they have enemies. Their gods have enemies. Um, the, the Zeus and, and the Olympians fight with the Titans. Every single Indo-European uh, pantheon has, has adversaries. They all do. You know, to say that because there is an adversary that it's somehow Christian. You know, this actually, he's actually using arguments that were created by Christians to assimilate and prove that everything came from the Bible. And we'll get into that. We'll talk about that in a minute. Do you see the pattern here already? We have the good God, we have the devilish God, and the good God needs, of course, a son who is very holy. Well, that is Balder. Balder does not serve the same thing as, as Christ at all. The, the, the Christ, Balder, uh, cognate is false. Number one, we can assume just from a, from a, a, a linguistic and historical standpoint, a theological standpoint, that we know for a fact that it is an error to assume that anything that exists and can be verified in Indo-European corpuses cannot be cognate to Semitic corpuses because they do not have the same root. It is, it is, um, it's not good. It's not good research. It's bad scholarship, and it's, it's a lot of time. It's very amateur. I'm not saying this guy's an amateur, but what I'm saying is that uh, these cognates were drawn by people that do amateur work. In all their writings, by the way, Balder is not such a holy god. He's basically a, a really like a warrior type of, of deity. Why are warriors not holy? You know, you look at the, you bring up the Hindu stuff. Uh, Sri Krishna is very, very holy. He's a warrior. Um, Thor is very holy. He is a warrior. All of the gods are warriors. Why aren't warriors holy? You know, why, what does that have to do? And what is this source, this older source that has Balder? You know, I mean, I don't, uh, this is the thing with some of these people is they make, they presuppose and they make all these, the, these arguments, but there's never any sort of source. They never say, well, this comes from this or this comes from that or this is where I got this. Where is the older source that talks about Balder that predates the Poetic Edda? I want to know that. So that's pretty interesting, you know, that's Christian influence. And um, another, another, I think, Christian influence is, is, for instance, that the thunder god Thor, he has a big enemy, that is the Midgard snake. That's a snake that's so big that it circles around, uh, around the earth and bites in his own tail. But actually, snakes to our pagan ancestors, snake. Okay. Uh the motive of the Thunder Striker fighting the serpent is in all Indo-European pantheons. It's in every single Indo-European pantheon. It's something that's it's like one of the most common ones, actually. You know, it's um, this idea of, of you see something that's, that's white and pure and therefore Christian or something that looks like it's just like Christian paranoia is what it is. You're just you're purposely looking for things that could be loosely. Balder has doesn't serve any of the function that Christ does. You know, it, he, you know, he's resur Yeah, he, why? Because he's white and holy and he comes back? You know, it's, it's not the same thing, you know. It's just a completely different function. To think that it's the same is, is an error. Snakes were uh, symbols of life energy. Yeah. So why would Thor destroy life energy? And also the, the holiness of the serpent is something that is found in Semitic cultures. It's not. It's not as. Um, it's not as prolific in Indo-European and more specifically in Germanic culture. It's. It's the, the serpent being holy is a is a trope that is brought forth by people from a Kabbalistic background that come from things like Thelema and comes like comes from you know Wicca whatever because to the the Semitic cultures like Mesopotamia and stuff like that the serpent was holy. <laughs> you know, and also portraying the gods and the giants as enemies is also a very Christian element. So like the, the Olympians and the Titans or the Asura and the Devas or so on and so forth? Because if you read between the lines, or not even, but it's, it's pretty obvious that the gods and the the... the the giants, they have a lot of overlap and they even intermix with each other. So it's not as simple as good and evil. 
that's the Christian idea that's brought into it. Actually, evil, the word evil itself is, is a Germanic word. It comes from the, the Saxon word ifele, which means something that is actually an excess is what it means. Something that is over, something that is beyond, something that is too much, something like something like something that's gluttonous could be evil, or something like greed is is evil. Efele is, I believe, how you pronounce the word. And then it became, um, I believe, the, the Proto-Indo-European word, ubelaz or something like that. But anyway, um, that coincides with like the, the Vedic understanding of what is adharmic. You know, the idea of having good and evil is not at all a Christian idea that predates Christianity by forever. This idea that there is a gray area and there's no such thing as good and evil and morality is subjective. This is all New Age stuff. This is all recent stuff. So, yeah, read, read the Eddas if you like. I mean, it's very interesting and there's lots of pagan elements still in it. But know what you're reading. Try to recognize the Christian way of thinking that uh, came into it. Now, another thing. Look at this. Deutsche Goethe und Helden sagen. German. We're going to fast forward and, a little bit. And, uh, serious. Well, it's actually the Icelandic. Ed so in the universe, that's without any limits and it's all silent, the universe. There was a being called Thimbletier. Okay. <laughs> like Christianity. You know, it's. And that was even before creation. So, wow, that sounds pretty Christian. <laughs> like Christianity. Every, every single religion ever in the history of time before Christianity had a creation myth. If you think that having a creation myth is Christian, then <laughs> you got to do some more research. You know, it's like the, this all powerful, unknowable God. Now, Fimboltier, it is said, yeah, but it's one of the nicknames of uh, Odin elements. Right, now, another on. thing to be aware of is um, organizations. I am not a member of a uh, pagan or heathen organization. The tribe of the fox is basically not an organization. It's a friendship between me and Dirkje. And there's another person involved in it. Um, and it's basically also a project. It's a YouTube project. It's our website. Uh, we have a Facebook and we have a Telegram. That's the project. And uh, we make uh, some field trips together. But organizations, they attract um, good people, sincere seekers. They also attract people who just want to use an organization to get some uh, status and some. I agree with that. Maybe even some power. Certainly. You know, so be careful. And organizations, uh, if you put people in the same organization, then before you know it, you start to think like the other people. You lose your, if you're not careful, you lose your own, um, you, your own individuality in thinking. So I don't. This presupposes individualism. You know, our ancestors, like I said before, they had they had a caste system. You know, this idea that everybody was free and and all this stuff. That's not true. Our ancestors were notorious slavers for one. They have an entire slave caste, a thrall caste. They had it was not this free libertarian liberal uh, enlightenment era idea. This stuff that this guy's talking about has more in common with Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. And uh, those guys, than it does with our ancestors, how they organize society. Say that that is the goal of organizations, but it does happen. So that's just a warning, you know. If you, there's nothing wrong with joining an organization, but recognize that process in your mind that you're not going to think exactly like the others do. There's always a risk. Now, another thing to be aware of, not to get fooled, is that. Um, some people, they like to give e themselves titles. They say, I am the high priestess of Freya. I agree with that. I am Ridiculous. the priest of Odin. And, or I'm the Vitki of my kindred. Or another one. This is a cool one. I am a room master. Because I've written a book. A room master. What the hell is a room master? 
I actually pretty much agree with him here. <laughs> I mean, the, these people walking around that just start calling themselves Gothies and Vitkeys and, and stuff. And there's even organizations out there that do ordainment that I, 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 you know, I wouldn't recognize their, their authority. You know what I mean? They're pretty much just, just camp counselors that have a gym membership. You know what I mean? That there's nothing really holy about them. You know what I mean? So I sort of agree with this, what this guy's getting at. If he's getting at that, uh, titles are stupid altogether, then I would have to reference what is historically accurate, which is our ancestors had got these. They had, they had a, the priest class. They had people that had real titles. All other Indo-European religions have holy men, have priests with real titles. They have a lineage, a divine lineage. They have initiations. They have, it's a real deal. If you go and if an Acharya, if you're in India and an Acharya walks into a room, people bow, people bow. If you were in the ancient times over here in Europe and a holy man, a, a priest, a Gothi, I'm not sure what the Greeks called theirs or the Romans, those guys walk into the room, you would bow and you would address them as such because these are people that walk with the, the excellence of the divine. You know, I mean, they dedicated their life to serving the divine. So this idea that there's every man is his own priest, there's no priest, titles mean nothing and stuff like that, that's just, it's, it, like I said, it has more to do with uh, modern liberalism and libertarianism, which actually comes from low church Protestantism. Uh, John Locke and Thomas Hobbes and these guys were actually uh, very much inspired by low church Protestantism and Calvinism. That's where those ideas come from. You know, Quakerism and stuff like that. That is what influenced liberalism and what this guy's getting at with this, uh, you know, completely free liberal libertarianism kind of stuff. Enlightenment era philosophy. It's not an authentic Indo-European hierarchical, patriarchal kind of idea, which is what our ancestors had. And going back to what he was talking about with uh, speaking of Protestants. You know, uh, this sounds Christian, this looks Christian. These are the same exact arguments. Balder looking like Jesus, uh, Thor fighting the snake, so on and so forth. That is comes from what is called the biblical school. I believe the guy was named Sophus Buka. And what their goal was, they were Protestants, and they wanted to prove that everything came from the Bible, that the Bible predated everything in Europe. So there's no reason to go back to being pagan or polytheist. Uh, because it all just comes from Christianity anyways. And they've pieced together this entire hodgepodge mess of um, uh, of a school of thought that the, the gods that predate the Bible somehow come from the Bible, is what they, what they were getting at. And, um, you know, Victor Rydberg ripped that apart, and he said, no, they are authentic native deities. And he dipped into the Indo-European stuff as well. Yeah, nice that you appoint yourself to being a room master. Doesn't mean anything to me. That's ridiculous. Maybe that's yeah, just right. my Dutchness. You know, I'm, you know, I'm born and raised here in the Netherlands, and so do many, many of my ancestors before they came from Germany to here. Um, Dutch people are not really into titles and all that nonsense. We just see through through that. <laughs> I don't know why you see through it. That's you know something that's part of what makes a a tradition legitimate and gives it its its you know makes it real. Here's a problem with some of these guys from uh, you know I'm, I'm not gonna piss a lot of people off when I say this, but I don't care. I'm gonna say it anyways. A lot of these guys from these European countries, and don't get me wrong, like my family came from Europe. Much love to my European brothers and sisters, but some of these guys that are from uh, European countries have been so heavily secularized for many generations that they can't even fathom the idea of something outside of liberalism, outside of the idea that there is hierarchy, that it, they, they can't think outside of egalitarianism, they can't sit, think outside of these things. It's impossible for them because they've been so heavily conditioned. And a lot of it, I'm going to be honest, I don't talk about World War II a lot on here. You guys know uh, what I, what I, my no-go zones. But this is a result of post-war propaganda. Yeah, you know, because of what happened in World War II, they wanted to ensure that nothing authoritarian ever happened again. So they brainwashed these people for many generations into liberalism and egalitarianism and all of this nonsense. So now they, they can't think outside of it. And they just assume that everything, even in the past, must go through that lens. And unfortunately, it's just not true. <laughs> That's also possible. Yeah. People with titles. I mean, what do you want to uh, to prove? What do you want to prove? 
Well, they're not proving anything. They are upholding the tradition and being professional and having a next level understanding of of the tradition. It's like, you know, if there's no titles, then why even have doctors? Why have doctors? Why have professors? Why have anybody? Why believe anything? Why do anything? You know, what's the point? If you're not going to have a next level that you try to achieve, if you're not going to have a next level of legitimacy, if you're not going to try to have mastery and perfection and, and uh, excellence and these things, why even do anything? You know, there's no hierology, there's no titles, there's no hierarchy, there's no nothing, just hippy-dippy, let's all just sit around kumbaya and all believe whatever we want and listen to the, the song in the trees or like whatever, you know, these hippie people say. It's like, why even do anything? Let's just, let's just roll over and just let everybody just, you know, do whatever they want to us. Let's have nothing. Let's, let's have no form or shape or convictions. So people... Yeah, don't don't uh, don't get fooled, and always think uh, as a as a individual, and always if you have the ability to do so, journey to other worlds, find yourself somebody who can teach you this. These people are available, and journey to other beings and to other worlds, and of course compare it to what you read. And you will see interesting differences between what is written and what your own experience is, is and talk to other people who journey. I mean, that is really getting first hand wisdom. And of course you should read and talk to other people. Yeah, absolutely. But always experience. Yeah, that spirituality is experiencing religion is just shut up and do what other people tell you. And it will be enforced. <laughs> That's religion. Spirituality, different. So, yeah. So, this is a short video about how um, not to get fooled. So, that's very important. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh that's all that it is. You know, this idea that that uh, spirituality and religion are different is it's just more modern, new age, liberal nonsense. How do you under how do you know how to be spiritual if you don't have a philosophy, if you don't have hierology, if you don't have something to base it on, if you don't have that that epistemological warrant, if you don't if you don't know what you're where you're coming from, you don't understand it, you don't speak the language, you don't know you don't know the. Uh, the meters and the verbiage if you don't know what you're doing then how can you be spiritual you're just going to walk outside and and you know spirits are going to come up and just talk to you randomly do you think they just they just randomly come up and like whisper something into your ear and here's my wisdom like that doesn't happen that's just that's that's fluffy make-believe in order to have true spirituality you have to put in the work and the work has has formula it's a routine. You have to do things a certain way. You know, it's it's not like it's not willy nilly free for all. You know, and a lot of people that talk like this, that say that it is a willy nilly free for all, I automatically know that they're they're fibbing. You know what I mean? That's unfortunately what it is. And I don't mean to disrespect this guy. Like I said, he seems like a nice guy. Yeah, you know, kudos to him for putting his face out there and and putting in the work and and willing to go out there and speak what he thinks is true. But unfortunately, it's not true. So uh, many hails to you, Mr. Tribe of the Fox. I'm sorry, I forget your name. But um, um, I hope after seeing this video and you do some more research and you look into the sources and you look into uh, the evidence and stuff like that, I, I pray that you you reconsider some of these these positions and um, some of the ones that you're saying, like, you know, every man is his own priest. There is no titles. There is no this. You know, I would like to see your sources for that, and I would like to see the source for uh, that that predates the poetic edda about um, Balder, uh, you know, not being the way that he is in the poetic edda. And I would like you to look into um, the difference between the prose edda and the poetic edda, and where the poetic edda comes from, because it is indeed an authentic pre-Christian heathen document. It is proven, 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 proven. That, that myth needs to be smashed into a million pieces, and I'm going to keep smashing it over and over and over again because it's not true. It's not true. All right, guys. Thank you for watching. Many hails.